Um, I, under, I understand why for some people that might be difficult. So, um, well, welcome to currently still the chair of West Ham Labour Party. Um, and we are hosting, Newham Socialist Labour are hosting uh, this meeting this afternoon. Uh, you can't you just see behind me, I'll put a few, <laughs> a few of our leaflets up. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about you very quickly about Newham Socialist Labour. Um, our CLP in March was uh, oh, nice. sus suspended alongside uh, East Ham, our neighbouring CLP. And together, West Ham and East Ham, that's five and a half thousand uh, members silenced, disenfranchised, etc. So in order to keep the left together, we set up Newham Socialist Labour. And we're very active in lots of grassroots campaign. So I'm really looking forward to this open forum today. We're hosting it, but it is being supported and facilitated by a WIN, the Workers International Network, and also the Labour Left Alliance. So thank you to those comrades for allowing this and ensuring that it happens. So... Um, Following the debacle that was Labour Party conference, we're going to discuss some very important uh, questions that keep on emerging um, in, any, in any forums that I and I'm sure you are involved in this. First of all, is the Labour Party finished? <laughs> um, can the left ever regain leadership of, of the Labour Party? And what can we learn from the Corbyn experience? Um, and how do we get together to fight back and I suppose the big one, what are the prospects for a mass party? So I'm going to ask uh, Roger Silverman, uh, who's a member of Newham Socialist Labour and the founder of Workers International Network. Roger Silverman, would you please kick off the discussion um, this afternoon? You're going to have about seven or eight minutes. And anyone who knows me knows that I do keep to time and I have a stopwatch on this phone. So over to you, Roger. Yeah, thank you. I certainly know that from experience. Uh, I'm just going to uh, make a few brief comments to start the ball rolling. Now, obviously, the Labour Party conference confirmed our very, very worst expectations. Uh, in the run-up to it, constituency parties were shut down, lifelong members were expelled, and even in the conference hall itself, delegates were barred and escorted out. Armed police were stalking the aisles. And of course, the speech by our great leader was absolutely appalling. Uh, actually, I mean, far, far worse than I could possibly have uh, imagined it would be. Um, it was clear that his first priority was not attacking the government, but twisting the rules yet again to make double sure that no socialist could ever be elected leader. And then just as an afterthought, he gave uh, a little political um, uh, political priorities. And the first he said is um, that it was um, uh, on children's mental health. Now, this, of course, is a very worthy cause and there is a genuine crisis. But what Starmer doesn't seem to realise is that what is causing young people mental problems is poverty, bad housing, poor education, lack of recreation facilities, no job prospects, the looming climate emergency, etc. So what young people need is not counselling and therapy, or at least not alone, but they need a future. They need hope. What they really need is socialist policies. Britain under Johnson is looking like a failed state. It's at a complete standstill. The, the, the petrol crisis, empty shelves in the supermarkets, uh, inflation shooting up. An end to the furlough, which is going to mean um, mass layoffs, cuts to universal uh, credit, which means people, maybe a million people plunged into poverty, rises in taxes, taxes, privatisation, corruption and all the rest of it. And um, when you look at that situation, as a Labour leader, Starmer, of course, is offering no alternative and not even any uh, resistance to all this. He's the um, worst leader we've ever had. But we have to put it, you know, let's judge him by um, his objectives. He's not a failure because his job is to crush the Labour Party as a force for resistance and to make it safe for capitalism. And in that sense, he's doing very well. 
if Corbyn, just imagine, if Corbyn was still the leader of the Labour Party, we could expect Labour to be way, way, way ahead in the opinion polls now. Um, so anyway, this is not the case. And we have the old seemingly futile dilemma. What do we do? Do we stay and fight, as we're told by, um, by the Socialist Campaign Group and so on, who seem to be doing rather better at the first half of that than the, uh, than the second? And, um, or do we uh, try to launch a new party? But we've already got so many of them. Both, both courses appear to be doomed. I think, in my opinion, there is no prospect that the left will ever be allowed to regain the leadership of the party. So staying and fighting seems to be a, you know, a not very uh, promising. On the other hand, launching a new party, we've got no shortage of left breakaway parties. Yes, we want a new party, but we want a new party not consisting of a few hundred people because we've got enough of them. We need a new party consisting of hundreds of thousands. And we know that we have those. That if, if Corbyn and the Socialist Campaign Group was to give a bold lead, then I believe that hundreds of thousands, once again, would rally to their support. I wouldn't accuse them of lacking courage, but I, I do think that they're lacking in um, perspective. As it is, we've got a deadlock, because the, uh, the policy of the left, the official left, always seems to be that we want, we have to recognise Labour is a broad church. And what I always say to that, you've probably heard me say it before, but a broad church should not be so broad that it, that it includes the devil. And um, the other slogan that um, Tony Benn used to say is, well, you know, a party needs two wings. It needs a right wing and a left wing. And again, I could understand that. And perhaps at one time, there was some justification for that before the new Labour years. But if you have two wings that are trying to fly in opposite directions, all you get is a split. And I think what is happening now is a split, but it's a one-sided split, which is being carried through ruthlessly by uh, the right wing and uh, has caught the left un unfortunately unawares. We need to find a way to mobilise that latent support. And I do think that what happens in Newham is uh, not a question of um, a little local wrangle. It's not parish pump. It's a, um, it's a kind of microcosm of the national picture. New Armed Socialist Labour, which is what we founded when we were um, when we were shut down arbitrarily overnight, two CLPs, is a kind of prototype, I think, of what's going to happen uh, over a long period, maybe protracted, messy, uh, localized, and so on. But the process that is that is uh, going to be uh, happening, I think, uh, naturally, our two CLPs, as I say, were arbitrarily shut down overnight. So the activists regrouped. Now, Newham, let's remember, has um, absolutely impeccable Labour traditions. It was the borough where, where Keir Hardy became the first Labour MP. It was the home for a long time of Sylvia Pankhurst. It was just down the road from George Lansbury when he was leading the uh, Poplar struggle in um, 1920. And um, it's 100% Labour Council now, for what it's worth. It's got a directly elected Labour mayor, not that we support that system. It's got two uh, Labour MPs uh, with huge majorities, one of them, I think, the biggest uh, in the country. But there are now two Labour parties in Newham. There's the active campaigners on one side, grouped in Newham Socialist Labour, and there's the, I'm sorry to say it, but mostly corrupt councillors um, uh, on, the, on, the on the other side. And I think that it's shadow CLPs like uh, Newham, which are going to be developing, which are developing here and there um, in, um, in, in one area after another. And also, let's remember, the key to the whole thing is the trade unions. Now, we see the RNT long ago left the Labour Party. The Bakers, just last week, also disaffiliated from the Labour Party. We, we hear that there's possibilities that the FBU and the CWU could also follow soon. And who knows if uh, in the longer term, maybe Unite might, might uh, go the same way. So I think we can see very faintly the outlines of a, of a real, oh, I wanted to say new Labour Party, that of course is the wrong phrase, but a, uh, a, a Labour Party, a left Labour Party um, uh, developing. 
So I've, those are just a few ideas thrown out. Obviously, all of us have got different um, ideas and suggestions about what's going to happen. And uh, I'm just, um, we'd throw, throw it open now. And I, I'd be very happy to hear what comrades um, can contribute. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much. Um, I'd love that description that Corbyn's not lacking in courage, but lacking in perspective. Um, I'm going to, I've written that down, I'm going to remember that because I think in many ways that really encapsulates the situation we have now. And, um, and certainly there are two Labour parties, at least in Ewan, um, and actually the socialist grouping is the biggest. So um, I think, yeah, we have 100 participants now, which is fantastic and very impressive. Uh, there will be people who obviously now can't get in because unfortunately our limit is 100, but they, people can watch it live streamed on the LLA Facebook uh, page. Um, I'm going to open it out for discussion, but before I do, I think, um, Roger, you had a message from Ken Loach about this meeting. Um, it's quite a long letter, I understand, but would you please read that out? And yes, then I will call people in to the meeting. Uh, one second. Okay, while you're so looking. I've got it now. Got okay. It? Uh, okay, off you go then, Roger. Um, right. Uh, right, dear friends, I'm sorry not to be with you this afternoon to share our thoughts on how we organise after the Labour conference. Here's a short contribution to the discussion. Starmer's attack on the left was all too predictable. He was part of the campaign against the Corbyn leadership from the beginning. Now the danger is that we fall into sectarianism and end up organising demonstrations and meetings, but with little hope of establishing a political presence. Can we avoid this? Jeremy Corbyn brought three to 400,000 new members into the Labour Party, inspired by his... John McDonald's and others' principles and program. Many of those who joined are now politically homeless. There are so many others in a similar position. There are several left unions, some of them outside the party, with leaders who have spoken strongly in favour of Labour's recent program. In others, there are signs of a resurgent left, like Paul Holmes's work in unison. There are also many campaigns who should be our natural allies against racism like Black Lives Matter, and against poverty, homelessness, and for the protection of the environment, the NHS, and a foreign policy based on universal human rights. The number is vast, and the majority are our natural allies. We know there are many principled, talented leaders in community and grassroots organisations, and also rising politicians, one or two in Parliament, and some who lost their seats in the last election. They have an energy and clarity that we urgently need. This is our strength, and added all together, it could be formidable. Can we transform these disparate elements into a united political presence? My suggestion is a movement led by those groups I have mentioned and that would commit to three or four unifying principles. For example, social and economic justice, universal human rights, protection of the environment. It may be that at the outset it would not have individual members, but a logo that all groups could share. Then it could unite those inside and outside the party. The key issue is the urgent need for an initiative to keep together the great mass of people who were inspired by Corbyn's leadership. Remember, this almost led to a victory in 2017. The common denominator is the desire to create a society where our common good triumphs over private greed. It would just be a start. I think it would need the presence of Jeremy and John as part of a collective leadership. This is a critical moment and it won't last. There must be half a million or more waiting for some recognised, trusted and principled leaders to fill this political vacuum. This needs more than a few lines to develop, but I feel we need something on these lines urgently. Individual groups on their own will not command the attention we need. We cannot be like the grand old Duke of York and march the troops to the top of the hill, only to march them down again. Solidarity, comrades, Ken Loach. That's fantastic. And um, 
I think we share that sense of urgency that um, Ken talks about. And, um, you know, I know he's very close to, to Jeremy Corbyn, and I hope that Jeremy Corbyn gets that message too and perhaps decides that, you know, he will, he, he will step outside of the Labour Party and actually um, do something that gives ordinary people hope because there are very, very serious issues developing. Now, I've got seven people already who would like to speak. Um, what I'm going to do is give you five minutes maximum, comrades. And as I said, I've got a stopwatch on my phone. Uh, please use the electronic hands. I know that some people find that difficult. If you do, um, please put something in the chat because... Um, Dave Buxton is monitoring the chat and he'll let me know um, and then I'll add you to the list. So, um, Tina, Tina Workman, I'm going to go to you first, Tina, when you're ready. I am always ready. Hi, Carol. Um, thanks for putting on this meeting. Uh, the LLA actually was going to do something similar, um, but when we heard that you're doing it, we, we thought a much, much better idea to co-sponsor, co etc. So yes, I, I agree with a lot of what, what Roger was saying. I mean, the, the easy answer is we have to fight inside and outside the Labour Party, isn't it? That's the easy answer. The, the difficult one is how exactly are we going to do that? And I'm not sure there are any easy answers at the moment. Um, it was good to hear Ken's letter. And while he was talking, and actually we've been thinking, I've been thinking about this for a while with other comrades as well, is that we, I think we need uh, some kind of strategy conference perhaps of the left who is interested in in something like that but we do get together take some time actually have maybe perhaps some some written contributions in advance but also develop ideas there and then but where where we go from here and you know co-host that perhaps by the LLA Labour Representation Committee, Jewish Voice for Labour, comrades who are actually interested in, in thinking things through, not, not every group on the left is, I don't think, unfortunately. Um, what I would say, though, on, on terms of Roger's um, contribution is that, yes, there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands who are very unhappy with what Starma is doing, who were inspired by Corbyn, et cetera. Um, but that it's not just the quantity, and that's, that's a that's an issue, I think, that it also depends on what, what we're fighting for, what, what kind of message we're putting out, what kind of platform we're putting out. Anti-capitalist, of course, pro-socialist, of course, Marxist, ideally, in my view, um, but that, that's something we can discuss. But the witch hunt, I think we cannot underestimate how important it is that any new formation has to be clear what's been happening in the last six years and what has led to the defeat, self-defeat of the of the Corbyn leadership. Um, I think probably most people in this meeting who are who are in this meeting are watching it are, are quite aware of what happened. It's of course the right attacking Corbyn, etc., the witch hunt against the left, the anti-Semitism smear campaign, etc. But not everybody on the left is prepared to say so. And I'm involved in a few uh, initiatives at the moment where I have to say it expelled, suspended, those threatened with auto exclusions are not welcome. And this is organized by the left. And there is a, not just a hostility, a, a, a reluctance to stand publicly in solidarity with people who we know have been falsely accused of anti-Semitism, etc. And there's still a reluctance to speak out. And I'm afraid, I think if that, if that is carried, that reluctance is carried into any kind of new formation, it will be utterly useless. And it's not something I, I think that would have any chance of making any kind of difference. The, any kind of new formation um, bringing together the, the left has to understand that appeasing the right is not going to work. If we ever want to have a chance of defeating the right, you know, we need to take them on and not bend over backwards and, you know, make this con concession and the other concession. You have to say clearly, these are our enemies. This is a class war. It was clearly a class war uh, against Corbyn. It had been fought by the right, not by the left. The left bent over backwards and that led to its defeat. Anything we build has to be very, very clear on that and has to stand in solidarity with those who've been 
proscribed and smeared, etc. And that is something where I think we still have to do an awful lot of work in the labor movement. I've just been to Labour Party conference, and you know, there's people coming up to you and say, uh, is, uh, you know, looking around, are they being, you know, can is somebody seeing me talking to you, talking to Jackie Walker? It's awful. There is such cowardice around at the moment that this is not something we can carry into anything and that's I think a, a, a lesson we have to work on very very hard over the next few months and it's not and it's not a fight we've won yet and it needs it needs winning before we can build anything serious. Thank you very much that was, and you were a bit under in time as well. <laughs> um, thank you so much Tina and uh, yeah any of you who listened to Crispin this morning um, will have, have seen, um, you know, a debate about the role of momentum. And can I just say, we have to remember that if you are expelled, you cannot, you're not a member of momentum. You're expelled from the Labour Party, you're out of momentum. And that is a disgrace. And it is about standing up for what is, and be counted, because the, we know the right are ruthless. We need to stand together, solidarity, absolute solidarity with Chris Williamson, with Jackie, with uh, Mark Wadsworth, with all of those people who've been suspended and expelled from the Labour Party, solidarity to them. Some of them are on this call and we're looking forward to hearing from them. Right, um, the next person I have on my list is um, Graham, Graham Durham. Are you ready to come in and speak, Graham? Right. Hi, comrades, and thank you, Carol. Once again, nice to see you again. Um, and, and when I was initially uh, suspended um, beginning of last year for standing for the NEC, I'm grateful to Newham Labour Party one, um, and, and Newham Socialists because they were the first to set up a meeting at which we could explain. And I'm being corrected by Tina that in this current round, the, the September round of auto exclusions, I wasn't the first, apparently but followed uh, Ken Loach, nobody better to follow. So um, for those of us who are expelled from the Labour Party, we have to echo what Tina says, but we also have to understand that the soft left, they've been the bane of my life for nearly 50 years now, the CLPD types and the uh, Arise and all, all these people. Um, they ain't going to fight because they're in there to build their own careers. And so in the main, though they like to do good things, I, I think uh, it's important to understand that you're not going to change those people's opinion. There they are many of them in there to build a career in a future left, as we saw happening under Corbyn and in Momentum. Many of the Momentum leadership that Landsman put together are actually now happily supporting Starmer and standing up and cheering him. I saw them at the conference. But I wanted to just briefly go back to the five questions that were posed for this meeting. Number one, which, which, which I think, Carol, you, you shortened them. There were five that uh, Roger sent out. Is Labour finished? No way. Labour's not finished. Um, I, could I, could, I could definitely see a situation in which um, a change of leader occurred. Somebody like Andy Burnham came in uh, and became quite a credible uh, alternative on a much more moderate and, and, and milk and water programme. In my opinion, um, the record Labour vote ever uh, in, this, in the UK was 48% in 1951. In, in 2017, we got 42.4%. Uh, and it would be quite easy to make up that gap if we'd had a, a party united behind a leader, in my opinion. So no, Labour's not finished. 12.9 uh, million votes only four years ago. We are a mass party, or rather they, I should say, are a mass party. Um, uh, and they can become that party again. Can the left ever regain, was the second question, control of the Labour Party? That'll take longer. Obviously, the changes need to be all reversed, and that would take time, and that would take a, a reinvention. But the left, in theory, could retain, regain control of the Labour Party in the sense that we ever had control under Corbyn and MacDonald. A question that I think really needs addressing on the left. What lessons can be learned from the Corbyn experience? I think there are three big lessons, three big lessons. They've been rehearsed before, but they're important lessons. Firstly, the day Jeremy was elected leader, I was in the conference hall. He went out straight afterwards and addressed a meeting of a refugee march, a refugee march, welcome refugees, which was fine. 
The trouble was that Jeremy then continued his tour of the UK for the rest of his time as leader. He didn't actually organize inside the Labour Party machine. He didn't stack the officials. He, didn't, he wasn't ruthless enough. He brought the wrong people in who wanted to compromise. He was too soft on the, on the right wing, Hillary Benn and these people who turned on him. It was weakness. It wasn't strong enough leadership. And that goes right down the, uh, the whole team that worked with him. There were terrible mistakes made, which we are paying a big, big price for, in my opinion. The second mistake, and obviously the, the Labour Party organisation needed sacking straight away. We needed to get rid of all those people and get them campaigning, which is what didn't happen in the 2017 general election. Second mistake, um, in my opinion, was the disaster uh, uh, in 2019 when groups that are represented on here, the Labour Representation Committee, for example, came out as a pro-Europe um, anti-Brexit uh, organisation that were clearly helping to build that opinion, which Starmer himself helped to build and John MacDonald helped to build and Diane Abbott helped to build, that we were, uh, we were anti the referendum result. There are people listening today, I'm afraid, who have a responsibility for that. Everybody that you doors you knocked on in any working class community, and I went to about six constituencies, were telling you, we voted no. We voted no to Europe. And your, your party is in favour of it. We gave Johnson an open goal. And those people who've made those mistakes, I only mentioned the LRC because I used to be active in it until they expelled me, um, it, uh, are, are equally responsible, in my opinion. And the third big mistake, and here again, I come back to John MacDonald. I remember the interview on Sky TV when John MacDonald said the Labour Party, in his view, is institutionally anti-Semitic. He'd completely collapsed from the original line, which was, we are an anti-racist party. We will not allow anti-Semitism in the party. It is a very small and tiny aspect of uh, a tiny proportion of our members. Completely collapsed from that line. And even today, some of us who were allegedly anti-Semitic, in my case, I confess, I called the chief rabbi at the time a Tory. That's why I was initially thrown out. That's not anti-Semitic. That's a political comment on a religious leader. But I mean, of course, when we've made these three big mistakes, we've looked like the anti-referendum uh, anti result um, party. We've looked like the anti, um, uh, uh, we've looked like we're guilty of anti-Semitism uh, and, uh, and we've not done anything about the Labour. Then obviously we've weakened our own thing. And, and I'm afraid it's hard to say, because I know how popular Jeremy is. He's a friend of mine, but he's a, he was the leader. And although he tried hard to fight against some of these things, he wasn't strong enough. That's, I think, an important set of lessons to leave. Okay, you, you've had Is your Labour time. on the verge of a split? Graham, you've had, you've had your time. I'm oh. going to give you 10 seconds to oh. answer that question. Right. I'm, I'm not happy. I'm not... Look, on prospects of a new party. Well, we're closer than we've been for a long time, but I don't actually believe it's a good thing, uh, to be honest, that the Bakers' Union are, are leaving. I don't think it's a good thing that any of the smaller unions leave. If we're going to split this historic party, uh, then we have to split properly and we need a big union, particularly my union, Unite, to take a decision to do so. Then we may have an opportunity to split. We just, okay. as I agree with Roger, we don't want any more of these tiny parties, no. tiny alternatives. Okay. Forming. We've got to be more than enough on the left in Britain. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Well, you've raised a lot of really um, interesting and controversial ideas. So I'm going to, which is really good. So I'm going to move on to Paul Collins. Would you like to come in now, Paul? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, um, this is a bit difficult for me to say because um, I currently chair of my CLP, but uh, but the result of conference. And the fact that Starmer is spent on his leadership, um, uh, thanks to the current Unison delegation of Unison, um, nothing to do with the current NEC I could add in their defence. Um, I now feel that the Labour Party is no longer a movement for social change and um, later on this week I will be resigning my party membership. 
Um, well, 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 it's ironic because I'm in Denver Week. You must know, you must stay in and fight. And uh, but I'm afraid the sight of seeing every shadow cabinet member get, getting up to speak, knowing that every one of them, in some way, apart from Andy McDonald, um, was in some way responsible for the defeat of 2017 and 2019. And it suddenly occurred to me that if we go for a general election, these are the dickheads that we're going to be campaigning for to be our ministers. Um, so my own personal position is to throw my my energy into the United Community. I've been a member now for a few months now. Um, at the same time, I also agree that setting up a new party um, Historically, it's not good, and I and I and I still think that uh, uh, another party would be destined to fail. But if if new and socialist Labour could somehow expand it geographical area, etc., etc., et I would join it. Um, but yes, but yeah, and I agree with much of the analysis of what's been said already, including. Uh, what money on the left did with regard to Brexit. It wasn't Gestama's Brexit policy. Labour delegates at that last conference voted for that bloody policy. Uh, so Graham is right. There are money on the left who bear responsibility for that particular policy. But yeah, the big mistakes were early on when they failed to adopt open selection for parliamentary candidates. Uh, and again, Unite and John McDonnell had something to do with that, I believe. And, of course, it's all very well, um, the circular group of MPs uh, saying we must stay in fight, but they're also defending their own positions. They're not in a position to be affected by the Tory cuts that are going to be coming in over the next few years and so on. So um, I'm sorry to be negative, but that's, that's my own personal position. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, I really um, respect the position that you're taking and, and staying in the Labour Party for some people, it's too toxic an environment, but others feel they can do that. And, and I think, you know, this, this open discussion is trying to find a way forward balancing both of those aspects. So thank you very much for your contribution. And can I ask Phil Pope from Bristol, would you like to come in, Phil, are you ready? Hi, thank you, Carol. Right, so I, I won't repeat what's already been said, but just to quickly recap, um, like Corbyn did not lead the left. Um, he was really hopeless. His leadership did give the left an opportunity to do it ourselves, to pull the party leftward and start fighting. But most of the left didn't even start that fight with the right. They just tried to keep Corbyn in office. And if you don't attack your opponent, sooner or later your opponent attacks you and beats you. Um, and... I mean, sadly, I don't think it's just Corbyn, it's the whole socialist campaign group. There isn't anyone in that socialist campaign group that you can say, if they were leader, they'd lead a massive fight against right the party. There isn't anyone in there that's going to do it. Um, and I don't even think the leadership can be regained. It's technically possible, but it is incredibly unlikely. They've put in rules to make it incredibly unlikely. The Socialist Campaign Group on its own can't put a candidate forward. And if someone on the soft left stood, they'd probably split the Socialist Campaign Group and you wouldn't even get all their votes to nominate a, a left candidate. So um, without the leadership of the party, I don't think there's a fight to be had. Without the cover of the leader being left wing, they will expel who they want. It's awful. You have my sympathy. And I'm prepared to speak out because I don't care if I get expelled because I don't think there's any future in the Labour Party now. 
But in truth, I can't defend any of you if you're expelled. I can't do anything to stop it. I can complain. I'll be ignored. We can all say it's terrible. We'll be ignored. And then they'll expel some more people. There's no fight to be had because it's not a democratic organisation. And without the leadership to protect us, we can't change it to be one. So is Labour, Labour's not finished, but I think it is finished as a potential vehicle for socialism. Um, so I think we should move on. Um, I'd rather the party had split and we'd kick the right out, but as it happens, they're kicking us out. And I think we've just got to make the best of the situation because the last five years haven't been a complete loss. We wouldn't have been having this meeting five years ago. I know 10 times more people on the left in Bristol than I did five years ago. Um, campaigns to organise the left have regularly raised tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds to come up with legal fees through crowdfunding. People are using social media, video conferencing. Uh, we have learned how to organise better, so I think we should use that to launch something new. And um, I think it's the people in this meeting are the people that have got to do it. We can't wait on maybe the unions will lead it, maybe Ken Loach will lead it. Um, I think we need to get on and do it and do it properly and raise money, like employ national staff to actually organise a big thing. That's one good thing Momentum have done. They got the politics wrong, but organisationally, they've built an organisation which has been defeated but still persists. They still have full-time staff. They still have a big income. They've created an organisation. I think we should start talking about doing that and doing it properly and make the best of our defeat and come back and organise. Thank you. Thanks very much, Phil. Again, you've raised some really crucial questions. Um, and if there's any time at the end, I'm going to tell you what we're trying to do in the room in terms of creating an organisation. Um, all right, I'm going to pass over to Tony Greenstein now. OK, thank you, comrades. The question of whether the left will ever gain, regain control insofar as it ever had control in the Labour Party is an esoteric question. It reminds me of these debates about how many angels can squeeze onto uh, the eye of a needle. Uh, the answer is we don't know. We each have, have our own opinions. What is clear is that there are thousands of socialists still left inside the Labour Party, so we cannot simply abandon them, whatever we do decide. Secondly, we have to take recognition of and, and understand what the Corbyn movement represented, which was an upsurge of anger, uh, in my opinion anyway, at the election of Cameron in 2015 against all the odds on the second lo lowest uh, uh, vote, I think, ever for a party that obtained an overall majority. But this was at a time, and it's still a time, when the working class is not engaged in struggle, in industrial struggles. So you have a very le low level of class activity and that must inform what kind of movement we are creating. The third thing is, I think we should abandon the idea, certainly in the near future, of party building. Our main aim is really to try and capture and keep together the thousands upon thousands of people, good socialists, who are leaving the Labour Party, and if we don't provide them with some place to go, they will simply dissipate to the four winds. And I think that is absolutely crucial. We need to create a body or a movement that can both relate to those inside the Labour Party and those who have left the Labour Party. The other thing I think we should, we should not be under any illusions about Keir Starmer. It, he is, as an individual, as about as pathetic as one gets, but it's not about his, him individually. It's not about the fact that he has to get stormtroopers to line the aisles in the form of the Sussex and probably Metropolitan Police 
uh, at conference in order to give his speech or to uh, bring in people who will cheer him because he knows they you in the hall or not do so. I think Starmer, I mean, Starmer wants to complete the Blair project, but Blair came in in entirely different circumstances, if you remember. It was a Tory government which had literally fallen on its own sword over Europe. Remember, uh, John Major was challenged by John Redwood uh, for the leadership. Major was calling half his cabinet bastards. Uh, it's an entirely different situation to the one that Boris Johnson faces. The fact is that whereas Blair quite easily triumphed over John Major, Keir Starmer, despite having the golden opportunity that Brexit or that, that COVID offered and all the other crises that we've seen, Starmer has been unable to lay a finger on Boris Johnson. For what it's worth, and I may be wrong, I don't think Starmer is... <laughs> that long in office as leader of the Labour Party. As there, I may be wrong, but the last conference reminded me of nothing so much as the Tory party conference of 2003, where Ian Duncan Smith had very similar arrangements in terms of stage debations, and he didn't last six months before he was voted out of office. There is no mechanism in the Labour Party to do that, but I imagine if he's told to go by uh, the, what used to be called the magic circle, he will go, uh, but we have to turn. We have to turn our attention to what principles underlie any movement. And the first one, and I think Tina is absolutely correct, is that we have to have a realistic understanding and assessment of what undermines the Corbyn project. And it's very clear that from the start there was a ruling class and establishment campaign using the anti-Semitism weapon to fatally undermine Corbyn. It was, if you like, identity politics writ large. And we have to be clear about that. It was the, uh, the advocates of apartheid Israel, coupled with the right of the secret state, which mounted a campaign which in the end toppled Corbyn uh, and almost rendered him impotent. So, but we also have to be clear that any socialist movement will be a movement that combines, if you like, what you might call reformists and revolutionaries and those who are in between. It won't be a revolutionary socialist party, but it will be a party that majority of Corbyn supporters can feel able to join or are attracted to. That is a tall order. Whether we can achieve it, I don't know. But I do think we have to try and make a start towards that goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Tony. Um, can I now move to uh, Matthew Jones? Hi, comrades. Yeah, uh, no, it's an interesting, useful meeting. This, and I think, um, I mean, really, <coughs> the the conference really sort of showed the the the. the the, the project of, of, of Starmer and Company, which is not, of course, to win elections, it's to destroy the left uh, and, and actually to change and to, to, to change the Labour Party to the point where it is no longer the Labour Party, as we know. I mean, I, you know, I think that the important thing, if you look at the, the history of the Labour Party, I mean, besides obviously the great betrayal of 1914 and going forwards, is that, of course, the, right, the, 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 the left has always been subordinate to the right. And it's fulfilled a certain function in terms of, you know, providing troops on the ground, etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and 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 obviously a certain um, you know point for that's been useful to 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 those of the right wing who dominate the thing. The point is about the, the point about the Corbyn movement, which I, I mean I agree with, with 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 Tony is actually driven by particularly the conditions on the ground. Although I don't think it's particularly the election of the Cameron. Government, I think it was more the question of, 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 of austerity and the imposition of austerity uh, following the, the crash of, of, of 07 08 and the fact that there was no, no clear means of opposing that. And, and suddenly, you know, the, the, the Labour Party was opened, if you like, by, by million, Milliband's manipulation uh, as, as a possible vehicle. So people took the chance. Um, and I think that's that's the that's the important thing. The, the point being is that that, that that suddenly the right wing understand uh, that the left can run can take over the party. You know, could do. I mean, obviously, 
not under the politics of, 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 of Jeremy Corbyn and so on and so forth, because I mean, obviously the problem is that the reformists will always concede, you know, I mean, under conditions in which you have a right wing which is clearly backed, you know, nakedly so by the ruling class, you know, I mean, to be, to be a left reformist uh, leader, I mean, essentially you, you're, you're onto a dead loss. I mean, this is why you have a position in which, you know, a, a guy like, you know, w w when, when, when Corbyn came in, a guy like McNichol, who's obviously going to be a saboteur and a complete um, wrecker to anybody who spends more than five minutes thinking about it, was, was left alone as General Secretary of the Labour Party until the, until the disaster of 2017, where it became obvious that, 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 that he's, you know, that, that they, 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 of course, wrecked that election campaign as far as they could. You know, and the thing is that the point now, of course, as I say, is to is to drive out the left and, and change the Labour Party to something that isn't actually the party of Labour in any real sense, as far as I can see. And so you can look at this conference and actually what's happening afterwards, uh, particularly, say, uh, you know, Starmer's article in The Sun, which is like coming out tomorrow, uh, as essentially a series of publications designed at driving out the left, you know, um, and a means of, of, of actually... You know, essentially, okay, they'll throw, they'll throw out a few people and they complain about the fact they can't throw enough people out fast enough. But what they really want to do is promote the, you know, the notion of trying to get people out, you know, get people to leave, which, of course, is, 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 is what they really want. Now, I mean, obviously, you know, this, this didn't raise the whole question, okay, well, you know, the whole nature of the thing, you know, where you have, you know, nakedly, you know, um, you know, misogyny, racism, even discrimination against disabled people, which are, are, are those, those, are, those are few who are, who are on Crispin's call this morning, very interesting. Of course, that, that's, that's the way that the, 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 the Labour Party operates, and we can see it in its history. So, I mean, I think that really under the current circumstance, when what you're doing is it, any, any, any strategy now, I mean, clearly the Labour Party is being closed off, you know, um, and the question is, okay, how do you operate principally outside of the thing? You know, and I, but I do think, I, I, I don't agree with Tony. I mean, you have to build a political organisation. That's what it is. You know, it, it is a political organisation. Now, some of those people may still be in the Labour Party or whatever else, but it is a political organisation and it has to function. I and mean, the problem is also, you see, what we have to do, have to do is say, right, okay, we're here to, to do a job, which is actually to provide a political organisation for the working class. It's simple. There isn't another one, you know, because the Labour Party is, is, you know, I mean, while, while we can say, okay, you know, historically it's performed some of that role in, in a particularly, you know, traitorous way and all the rest of it, and really as, a, as, as functions as an instrument of the ruling class. I mean, now they're abandoning that whole, whole entire notion. And the question for us is, okay, well, you know, that, that, that's the thing we have to take on. That, that, that's, the, that's the central point. And the question is, okay, you know, how do we then get... As people have said, you know, the likes of the, of the trade unions and so on, and, and to take to take that on. And the problem is also, and as comrades have also said, is that there is a, a, an issue of the level of the class struggle in this country. I don't think it's. I don't think it's. I don't think it's. It's an. It's, a, it's an overall issue. I mean, if you look at what's happening in other countries, there has been an upsurge in the class struggle. There's even been an upsurge. I mean, even an upsurge in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the United States of the working class to a degree which has not been seen in in, in decades. Yeah, in some cases not at all. So I mean, the, these things are all coming, but but this is the central point: is we need a political organisation, and that political organisation has to actually say, right, okay, this is we need an organisation for the working class to fight the struggles for that class. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, um, Peter Jones from Sheffield. Hi, Peter. Hi, Carl. Thank you, and thanks to Roger for the invitation. Um, I wanted to return to Ken Loach's very pointed contribution that was read out right at the beginning, because that's where I think we are. The issue is, what do we do? And Ken has at least put forward some concrete suggestions for how we might move forward. I don't necessarily uh, agree with all of them, but I think this is a point which we should now take up with him and, and invite Ken for a further, more detailed discussion of the way forward uh, along the lines he proposed, because I think that's one of the most important and interesting contributions I've seen uh, for 18 months or so on how we fight back against Starmer. 
my my entire focus personally is on this uh, democratic renewal within the party within the Labour Party itself, the fight against the Starmer leadership and its replacement. And so we might debate for endlessly the, the pros and cons of another working class organisation outside the Labour Party. But for me, the fight in the in the Labour Party, or the fight rather for the Labour Party, is not over by any means. We have barely begun. And the problem is that we are so disorganized, we're so fragmented and dispersed in different groups that we failed to punch at our weight, the weight of those hundreds of thousands of people who supported Corbyn and who are still around, they've not gone anywhere, either inside the Labour Party or without. But I think the conference, the Labour conference is, is, is a clear uh, watershed for us. Because I think there were many who were reluctant to pursue a more vigorous anti-Starmer line in the run-up to the conference because they thought that something was going to change. They thought that David Evans, you know, wouldn't get appointed or they saw, thought something else would happen. Now, we know what's happened now. And we know that as a result of the conference, the Starmer coup will consolidate itself, will strengthen itself with all the means it can and we'll be able to target those people who spoke at the conference in ways that the Starmer leadership doesn't like. We, we, we've lined ourselves up for suspension and expulsion in, in an unprecedented way. So while we must struggle within the Labour Party to the extent that we can, it means that the organising centre for a mobilised resistance against the Starmer leadership must be based outside the Labour Party in, in, in resources and in groups and organisations that are outside the reach of the party machine. So there are a number of things I, I think we need to do. Um, I think for me, the issue is what unites us or what unites those of us in a coalition of the willing, if you like, is the understanding that this Starmer leadership must go. It's an illegitimate leadership. A coup has taken place. They're in, the pro they're in the process of destroying the Labour Party, not just the left. This, this, the whole party now is, 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 is under threat. So this is a fight for the Labour Party itself. And the principle for organising and mobilising must be that this leadership is, is illegitimate. It's there by deception and by abuse of power. And it must go. And that must be the organising call, I think, and the principle for all those organisations and individuals who are wanting to do something, that this leadership must go. And how are we best to organise to make that happen? As part of that, I think, even from this meeting, you could start, you could write directly to all the representatives of those many organisations that we know already, uh, to which many of you already belong. And, and to the left-wing media channels, Novara, to, to Crispin's show, to others, to, because we need an HQ. We need an HQ which has a media arm and also a, an organisational arm in which all of us can come together on the principle that this is now a fight for the leadership of the Labour Party, for the soul of the Labour Party, and is a fight to get rid of that leadership. And on that basis... I think we can't neglect and overlook the issue of the of the SCGs. I know what people think about them, and I know what I think about them, but they still have uh, envious, rep enviable reputations, and their their opinions still matter to many, many thousands of people in the Labour Party. You may also have heard rumblings in the SCG. They're now even starting to talk about a leadership challenge, whether they've got the requisite forty votes and all the forty thing 40 votes or whatever it doesn't matter what they have or not but the movement we need we need to insist that they do it we need to insist that okay put your money where your mouth is now is the time announce a leadership campaign not necessarily who's going to be the leader but announce a leadership campaign against starmer prepare that leadership bid with mass meetings all over the country and a national meeting to prepare and, and, uh, and get ready for that leadership campaign against Starmer. And those are some of the things I think uh, that we need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. It's great to have practical suggestions. As an ex-primary head teacher, I'm always into the practicalities of stuff. And on that note, um, 
The next person I'm asking to speak is uh, Mr. David G. Evans. The G is important here, isn't it, David? Yes, thank you very much, Carol. Uh, I'm <laughs> David Evans from uh, Cheltenham CLP. And uh, sometimes I thought perhaps I should have put my for myself forward as sort of a paper candidate against the other David Evans. But anyway, but that's by the by. Um, I, I most agree with what... Uh, uh, Graham Durham said, and uh, Tina said, and I also agree with quite a lot of what Peter Jones has just said. But I just wanted to say, put my own perspective on it, if you like. Um, first of all, yes, I, I do think these suspensions are are, are something we, we can't ignore. And it's quite true, a lot, of the, a lot of the soft left, even some of the harder left, seem reluctant to stand up. And I think that's partly due to... Uh, lack of education, if you like. They've been brainwashed by the media. And this is another thing people haven't mentioned, of course. The failure of the BBC, ITV and Channel 4 um, to, to talk about this in terms of a coup, to talk about this in terms of corruption. I mean, some of the things that Stan has got away with would not be out of place in Belarus or in a Trump campaign, quite frankly. And um, I, I don't know whether it's too late. I hope it isn't too late, because I think we, we need to pursue that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the second thing is, uh, I, 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 I'm afraid I don't agree, I, you know, there is possibility of another party and I've got sympathy with people who've left. I've left the Labour Party twice in the past, once demoralised by Thatcher, twice after the Iraq war. So I'm not against it in principle. Personally, I don't feel right, now is the right time to leave, nor do I think now is the right time for a new mass party, but the time could come, certainly, if we had a big union behind us, so I accept that. Just quickly on the history of it, though, I also agree that Corbyn, um, he did fail in many respects. He didn't lead. Um, he tried to sit on the fence on Brexit like Theresa May did. And I would have preferred him to come down on the side of Brexit, frankly. Um, I left Brexit. Um, and of course, uh, Starmer was largely responsible, in my opinion, for us le losing that, that, that election and whenever it was a year or so ago. Um, but uh, yes, I've got... A couple of positive points, though. As I said, I don't don't agree with those extremists or purists, I should say, who think that we've got to have a pure a pure left party because it isn't going to happen straight away overnight. So, apart from, like I say, education, I think there are some other things, and um, um, one of them is the, the CRPs. Even though they're a lot dominated by the right wing, perhaps because a lot of the uh, left wing ones have been suspelled or suspended. Um, it, it, it is still true that quite a lot of the resolutions that came through conference were not necessarily right wing. So I don't think we should give up, give up from that perspective. And the other thing I'd like to say is going back to the mass movement of five or six years ago, whenever it was, I mean, in Cheltenham, things were buzzing, as I'm sure they were all, all over the country. And most of our, I think more than half of our uh, exciting activists have left or, or, or been pushed out or whatever. But uh, that wasn't just because they wanted socialism or because they didn't like Cameron. Those are both part of it. They're also much more modern in the sense that they were pro-European. I'm pro-European, which is not the same as pro-EU. And they're also much, much younger and, and greener. And people have talked about socialism. They haven't talked much about green policies. So what I'm saying is, in principle, there is a chance to, to get power. God knows how we're going to do it, but I would have said, this is the final thing, that we need to be realistic. And personally, if it came to an election against Keir at this moment or in the next year or whatever, the left has got not much chance, frankly, because of all the, um, you know, the right-wing MPs, even if the socialist campaign can drum, drum together 40, 40 MPs. That's not, that's not good enough, I'm afraid. So personally, I'd be prepared to compromise and support someone like Burnham or, 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 or Gardner, perhaps. Anyone who would actually um, agree or half agree even to let suspended people back in and to give us a chance. Because I think it may be several years before the left has actually, and young people have a chance to regain control of the party. But it still could happen, I think. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not happy about waiting seven years, I tell you. I don't know if I've got seven years, and so I'm really not happy about waiting. Um, Graham Bash, you're on next. 
Oh, well, comrades, I've um, been a Labour Party member for practically 53 years, now facing auto expulsion. And I need to say, I think this is probably the most difficult moment that I and we have been in, because we have to work out some very, very difficult options. Now, from this excellent meeting, I think there is some consensus about avoiding twin errors. On the one hand, the error of premature electoral errors. Like many of us here today, I've been, uh, I've been around too long uh, not to notice the skeletons of all those failed electoral adventures, which may get a couple of hundred or at a few thousand votes, but leave the balance of forces in the party and the movement untouched. But there's an equal determination today to avoid business as usual. It is a watershed we're in. That conference last week was a watershed. It has, for the foreseeable future, locked out the left from leadership. We have seen a witch hunt, the like of which I don't think any of us have experienced. 150,000 have left, another 100,000 or more will go. And I agree with Roger's first point, uh, that um, this is not a failure on Starmer's point, on, on, on Starmer's part. This is the aim of the exercise. Um, after all, there's no point in saying what has happened is unfair. I think it was Tina or someone else said, this is deliberate, it's class war. And that's what we're facing in the Labour Party, it's class war. And this idea that somehow it's business as usual, keep our heads down, uh, wait for the next conference or the conference after that, is actually totally inadequate to the tasks we now face. So leave aside those twin errors. How do we now operate? Firstly, there is a movement still in the Labour Party. We saw it on the votes for Palestine. We saw it on the votes for the Green New Deal. The, light of the trade unions or the majority of Labour Party trade unions, even with the Bakers uh, Union leaving, are still there. And it isn't our task to walk away while those still fighting remain isolated. So that isn't on. Nor do we accept their rules, the Starmerites rules of the game. That is, accept the witch hunt, refuse to stand with those who have been wrongly expelled or suspended or prescribed. But above all, there is a class struggle out there, and it's that which will determine our actions. We have to be, if you like, the vehicle for resistance, trying to bring it into the party if we can, but connecting those areas of resistance, those focuses of resistance as well. I mean, it was Karl Marx that explained that we have no, uh, the communists, of which I'm one, have no interests separate and apart from that of the broader working class. That does include those still in the party, even if those numbers are shrinking. Now, if you're saying what does this amount to exactly in practice in terms of party and movements and class, I think that we're all struggling to find a way. We're in new conditions. But if we can avoid the ridiculous extremes of electoral adventures or business as usual, standing for a principled socialist position, then we can at least begin the task of rebuilding the resistance to this government, which is not only bringing, uh, I mean, it's not only bringing our movement uh, uh, to a state of crisis, it's bringing the whole globe. There isn't much time, and yet we have to somehow try to patiently build an alternative. It's not gonna be easy, comrades. This is a difficult moment. And anyone who thinks they've got all the immediate answers, I think we should be very, uh, uh, very careful about. But if we can begin to pull that kind of wisdom that we've seen today together, then we may actually be at the very bottom of our kind of level of struggle and begin to move forward. And it ain't gonna be easy, but we need to be both principled 
and show solidarity with each other and be united. But remember, comrades, above all, we do not separate ourselves unnecessarily from the broader movement and especially the trade unions who are still in their fight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. And solidarity to you, um, Tony Greenstein, and everybody else who's felt the, 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 the Starmerite purge. And I appreciate your comments and the gravity of them. Can we now have Steve Freeman to speak? Yes, just unmuting myself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, comrades. Um, uh, the first thing I want to say is just ask the question, what is actually dead? What has just died at this moment in time for us? Let's think about that. I think what's died is the Corbyn programme has died and the broad church Labour Party has died. I didn't say the Labour Party had died. I said the broad church idea of a Labour Party had died. So if we're looking for something new that is not dead, then we should look to Tony Benn instead of the Corbyn programme. We should look to Tony Benn's programme and instead of the broad church Labour Party, we want to look to a new model Labour Party. Not a new party, a new model Labour Party. And it'd be interesting as an historical, I chose those words carefully, because in 1644, when the parliamentary army was being slaughtered by the Royalist armies, Cromwell didn't leave and go home. They formed themselves into a new model army. And then after that, they were able to come back and get stuck in with a much stronger force than they had before. And that's the approach we should take to have a new model Labour Party. That's what we have to build. And the Benite program is it. It's not about leaving or staying. That's a false, as far as I'm concerned, a false argument because that party must be built within and outside the Labour Party. The, the, the thing we have to ask ourselves, the fundamental thing we ask ourselves is, was the is the Corbyn programme correct? That's the elephant in the room. That's the thing that nobody's really talking about. And that programme was to restore the 1945 social monarchy from the high point of the Labour government. Have we got to go again with that same programme? And Roger gave me the answer why we shouldn't go with that same programme. Should we try to rally the, the, the left behind the 1945 social monarchy again? Because if that programme is not right, no amount of defending it and no new tactics will, will get us on the right track. Roger appealed to the socialist campaign group, but they're absolutely wedded to that program, by the way. So if you, if you think they're going to help us, then forget about that. But Roger said something important. He said the state has failed and the democracy has failed in this country. Democracy has failed in the Labour Party and democracy is failing in the country. And the idea that we can somehow sort out the Labour Party problem without addressing the bigger picture in the country seems to me is false. What did the Corbyn programme say about the crisis of democracy? Can anybody answer that question? The answer is not much. Not least when he took the oath of allegiance to the Crown by joining the Privy Council. That tells you where, where that was. So in a way, Corbyn revived the socialist movement. Let's give him credit, by the way. We, as, as comrades have already said, I'm not knocking that. But unfortunately, that has got, we're either going to go back to New Labour or we're going to go somewhere else. And we should go back to the 1990s. And I think, I think uh, Tony mentioned this idea. Back in the 1990s, when the Labour Party, basically the Labour Party, uh, had to go in one direction or another, it went to New Labour under... under Blair and Brown. But on the left, the left split because Ben came forward with a Republican Democratic program, which he put in his bill. And Scargill, who was another main leader of the left that time, split and formed the Socialist Labour Party. So we are really like a re, it's like a re, <laughs> a revisiting the 1990s. This time, new Labour's coming back in the form of Starmerism. And we have to come back either as Arthur Scargill reborn or we have to come back as Tony Benn with the policy that he outlined. Tony Benn had a massive amount of uh, things to say for us and we need not just to copy. I'm not talking about copy because Starmer will not copy Tony, uh, uh, Tony Blair. He'll come up with a different version of New Labour. We're not just going to copy what Tony Benn said. 
because we're 30 years down the track. But the essence of what he was arguing, right, the essence of what he's arguing is how we can organize ourselves in that way. He argued for a democratic and social republic. There has to be an alternative to a state that is collapsing day by day under our, under our ideas. And the idea we can just carry on with proportional representation or something like that to deal with that, we cannot. So we have to have a fundamental rethink and rebuild ourselves a new model Labour Party. Take that lesson from history and not get stuck into leave or stay or that sort of argument. We need a new It's an excellent book, but as I say before, we've got to have a modern version of that, by the way. But it is, it will give us the weapons we need. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And we have to look at that with fresh eyes and a new, new direction, because what's just happened, things have died, and we have to clear that out of the way. We kind of have to start again in a new direction. And then we can rally all sorts of people to our, to our flag. By the way, just to this last point, republicanism is not about the queen. I just want to emphasize this point. It's about democracy in our towns and cities, how we organize ourselves, how we organize our trade unions democratically, how we organize our parties democratically, and how we have the organi democratic organization where sovereignty is rested. Thank you. So I want to get everybody in. So I'm going to go to Terry now, Terry Deans. Hi, Carol. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can thank hear you. you. Carol, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to you and anybody else who's helped you to get this organised today. Um, it's, it's a great meeting and it was fantastic to see you at the Rialto at the weekend, just gone. Um, I think it's very difficult. I think Graham Bass sort of touched on it. You know, this is a, a conversation we're having five minutes here and five minutes there. It's going to be very difficult for us to bash through. Sorry for the sorry for that, Graham. <laughs> to get through the, the you know the uh, work all this out. So it's it's a beginning. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I think I'm in the company of uh, a lot of very very experienced socialists and people who've been involved in politics in 40, 50 years in some cases and. Uh, some very experienced students of the political ideologies and various things. I don't come from that background. I'm um, sort of, I was uh, ideologically sort of absent, or I don't know if that's the right term, but I wasn't involved in politics uh, from the age of uh, 18 voting age up until I was nearly 55 years old when I joined the Labour Party. So I'd never even voted in my life before. So I hear people talking about losing hope and stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry, I spent 38 years of my adult life thinking there was no hope, you know? So I understand the feeling, but, but look what happened. It, it, something did happen, didn't it? Um, something which changed, the, changed my, my perspective. And as I say, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of the, uh, the, um, the, the politically naive, let's say, which is, the, which is the vast, vast majority of the people out there who we, I think that we need to be encouraging to get involved in this fight back or to overthrow the current system. Um, so, and I also think... I refer to the older, more established comrades. I think that we have a duty. Um, I'm getting old now. There's, I think that we, we have a duty as older people to, um, to, to, to stay positive and to, to show the way for the young people coming behind us because that's where it's going to happen. And um, so I just wanted to really echo, I think Peter Jones hit the nail on the head with his, the tone he struck with the positivity. I saw a gentleman called Forty Sullivan in the chat who was saying similar things. And Steve Freeman has just mentioned it again. I think that, um, as Graham Bass said, it's not easy to uh, find all the answers, but we have to start somewhere. And that's, to me, that start somewhere is for us to unite and to exemplify solidarity. I was introduced to the word solidarity and unity when I came into the Labour Party. It's synonymous with left-wing socialism, apparently. But what, I, what, what I'd like to see more, guys, I'd like to see us exemplifying that more being more positive, being the change that we want to see, using the language of solidarity, using the language of unity. People, There's a lot of people out there have been very wounded about what's happened. They've lost hope. 
they thought that Corbyn was going to bring everything in and we thought we were on the threshold of a great victory. And we were on the threshold of a great victory. Corbyn may have lacked the, uh, the, 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 the skills necessary to bring us over that finishing line. But we got up to that finishing line. We could smell it. We could taste it. So whatever, we, whatever Corbyn's faults were, the one thing that he did do was he brought us together. I think Phil Pope mentioned it. We wouldn't have been having this meeting today if it hadn't been for Corbyn. So I think that we have to stick to the positives and exemplify the fact that even though we're damaged, even though we're hurt, that we, we've got the strength, we've got the capabilities, we've got the mentality um, to fight back and to raise ourselves up and to exemplify to the next generation behind us. It's not going to be just about us. It's about the rest of them coming behind us. And so for that reason, I would just like to sort of put a little word of warning out um, from someone who comes from a military background um, that uh, if we start using language like calling people cowards uh, who have been intimidated, I think we need to understand intimidation and fear. I was brought up in a country which was, uh, which was destroyed by intimidation and fear. People killed each other. People in communities, people next door neighbours um, uh, fought and killed each other because of um, fear and because of intimidation. So we need to be careful that we don't um, dis dis disengage or disenfranchise those people who are not quite as good as some of us at facing up to intimidation and fear. Um, some people get cowed by it, some people are, are strengthened by it and they move on. We need to, I think, nurture those people, exemplify to them how we can bring them along with us. They're wounded. We're all wounded. So we need to be able to uh, show how we can look after our wounded comrades and bring them along. So I'm careful. Of course, there is cowardice out there, not denying it, but we need to make sure that we don't tar everyone with the same brush and leave them abandoned on the roadside. Because I think that's what solidarity and comradeship is. Um, Ken Loach, I, I agree with Ken. I think there's things we can do. Um, so I think that uh, community organizing, I think we need to sort of, the things like shadow CLPs are going on now with Labour and Exile Network. And it's, it's basically just about getting people positive and working in their communities and being some sort of a pressure group in the local Labour Party. Um, I've probably got a few more things to say, but... Yeah, as I, you're over time now, Terry, so... I'm not going to say any more. I think <laughs> I've just made my contribution. And there's going to be lots. I just hope that this is the beginning of a, a, a larger brainstorming session, Carol, um, where we can find those solutions that Graham was talking about. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Terry, for your contribution. I'm going to go swiftly now to Mia. Mia Mantry. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my thoughts... Yeah. Uh... Yeah, my thoughts are that um, um, yeah, my thoughts are that uh, uh, I can understand why people are scared, uh, feel di uh, disheartened with everything that's happened, and I get it. But I think the thing to remember is just how close we came to winning in in 2017. And yes, things did happen. And like now we're um, and like, OK, things didn't work out. But I think um, mistakes were made with the Corbyn project, but we did get a lot right. And I think the thing to remember is that this is the first time in decades that anything on this level is being achieved. And sometimes these things sometimes take a few goes to get it right. And I feel that having having something um, along similar lines in the future, looking at what what we got wrong, uh, and and also looking at what we got right, um, and like, okay, maybe not have it exactly like uh, that, but like take a, take all the good bits of which there were many. And I think the thing to remember also is that since the last election in 2019 a lot has happened and i think people's priorities have changed people's thinking on the world like i know that the government used to say that they couldn't um that things couldn't be done about tackling homelessness and yet they house the homeless overnight um for all the wrong reasons but it's like I think a lot has been shown that more can be done than we've been led to believe. So I think people's, um, like, I think, um, like, 
the Corbyn project or something similar might be more successful in the future. And as for for whether we should, um, as for for whether to stay in fighting Labour or or form a new party, I've sort of I'm staying for the moment. Uh, but I can see all sides. Like, but I think sort of whatever we do, we need to. I think the whole movement needs to decide one way or another. Um, but I think sort of maybe the fact I have a, a left MP, Mary Foy, and a left CLP uh, sort of probably has, inf has certainly influenced my decision to stay. But yeah, I think sort of we, I think we shouldn't water down our views. Um, and I think we need, I think, as I say, sort of, it's... It, this sort of has only been tied once. We can have another go, and and I think a lot has changed since twenty seventeen and twenty nineteen. So I think, but yeah, I think it's just a question of whether or not we we, we stay in Labour or form a new party. But I think sort of, I think sort of it needs to be thought about and. I think organization, I think we need to get better organized and for for sort of the whole movement to decide one way or another. So yeah, that's me. Thank you very much, Mia. Um, can I move to Leah, Leah Levain from, I believe you're in Hastings, Leah. Yeah, You're still muted. We can't hear you, Lee. Oh. Now, I'll move on to the next person and we'll try and um, see if we can uh, sort out that issue of your uh, mic. That's a shame. Um, Steve McSweeney from uh, East Ham, I believe, Steve. You're still muted as well. There you go. Okay, thanks. Yes, I am just up the road in East Ham. Um, and, well, first of all, thanks to Roger and Carell and the others for organising the meeting, um, which is, um, I think, characteristically thrown up a pretty wide range of approaches and ideas. So I'll, I'll add mine to uh, the mix. I think I should begin by recognising, we all recognise, I should imagine, that the answer to these problems are not going to be found quickly, and that this is the beginning of a clarification process and a dialogue and discussion that was going to go on for some while yet. Um, in contributing to that discussion, I, th I think we have to begin by looking at what the lessons are of the last six years, which were really quite an extraordinary period in the Labour Party, and indeed working class. History. Um, I think we can all remember, notice most of us seem to be of much the same vintage, um, and I think probably none of us can remember a period of quite so much enthusiasm and activism as surrounded the initial um, campaign around Corbyn's uh, election as the leader. I, I remember quite vividly the pictures of youngsters breaking into Camden Town Hall to go to the political meeting. I can't remember that ever happening before. Um, but what I think we have to ask, ask ourselves is why that tremendous enthusiasm and those, what, 300, 400,000 new members were not able to change the direction of the Labour Party sufficiently. Um, and I think... That's a very fundamental question, because if we want to build a party that can, um, trend, well, in my opinion, overthrow capitalism, um, we need to learn something about the structure of the Labour Party and not do that again. I think the, um, the point about the, the Labour Party is that its entire structure, the, the, the whole way in which it operates is designed to oppose what's the, 
the new members wanted to do um, after 2016. And I think the whole structure, its traditions, its priorities, whole way of operating um, was designed to not respond to the enthusiasm. And at the heart of all of that, and I think this is at the heart of the whole question, um, is parliamentarism. It's, it's the complete commitment to, that the only political strategy is to win elections in order to form a parliamentary majority is what paralyzed the left in the Labour Party and always has. Because if you want to win a majority, you have to hold both wings of the party together. Uh, and that has always been the reason why the right was able to um, discipline the left. And it's not just a question of cowardice on the part of various people. I mean, no doubt there are cowards, but it's the commitment to that strategy is why the left of the Labour Party always feels that it has to limit its own activity and its own demands uh, in order to keep the right wing on board. Whereas the, the right wing has no such hesitation because they don't want to transform the, the society. Um, they want to manage. And therefore, from their point of view, um, they, they don't see in their party people whose, who in ever, whatever shape, whatever programme, uh, are hostile to capitalism. And I think if we don't get to the bottom of that, and we continue to try and build parties simply on the basis of the electoral strategy, we will only reproduce um, the same problem. And I think the, the scale of the paralysis is illustrated by the fact that Jeremy Corbyn, who all of us have seen for donkey's years, um, perfectly genuine man, not uh, a careerist, not trying to feather his own nest, None of, no such things can be said of him, and yet, he found that he couldn't fight against the outrageous accusations of anti-Semitism, not only against himself, but to the, at times, the majority of the party, you would think, reading some of the newspapers. And, uh, but why did he not fight back? Why did the Socialist Campaign Group not fight back against those charges? I think... Um, it was always because of this need to keep the right wing on board because otherwise they'll split the party and we'll never win an election and, and all the rest of it. Um, and I think the heart of the problem that has to be learned for the future. Uh, with regard to the situation now and what, what faces us now, the Labour Party remains what it has always been. It is, um, as they say, a bourgeois workers' party. Um, and it's a key element of it um, is, increase, is the central role of the trade union. And I think that will continue to be the reason why the Labour Party will be pulled left and right, as it always has been, because its social roots are in the working class, but its leadership it supports capitalism. That's where the tension and the contradictions come from. Quick, uh, you're out of time, Steve. You literally sum up in 10 seconds, please. I think, therefore, we have to be active within the class struggles that will develop in the, probably in the quite near future. We should demand that the trade unions demand that the Labour Party defend and support working class interests. And if it doesn't, they should think about forming a new party. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'm going to go back to Leah. Yes. I mean, I'm sorry, internet doing bad things. Um, I don't think I'll need my full five minutes because a lot of my points have been covered. Um, I agree a lot with what the previous speaker said. The, the focus on elections has been a bane of the Labour Party, particularly for those who came or joined or rejoined um, in 2015 or since the Labour Party meetings were overwhelmingly about I remember having campaign reports and the campaigns were only about electoral campaigns. Um, and we had a lot, a lot of elections, but anyway, that's a whole other story. So of course we shouldn't ignore that, but to have the focus of the struggle so so much on that is uh, has been a, a real drain of a lot of the enthusiasm and excitement. 
So, I mean, some of the points are obviously, I mean, 150,000 have already left, left. I think a lot of people were hanging on for conference. And I, despite the few victories that we had that Graham, for example, referred to, I don't think that's going to be enough to keep uh, the majority of left-wing people, or large numbers of left-wing people in. Plus, people are disgusted at the way many of us are being uh, treated. Um, so, uh, for those of you who don't know, I was excluded mid-conference. Auto, sorry, I wasn't expelled. I was auto I excluded myself apparently. Um, and um, I think one of the things about the way in which we structured the Labour Party, the way in which politics with a big P are run, is so much relies on the leader. And I think a lot of people came rushing into the Labour Party and expected, because we had the leader in place, all we needed to do was support the leader. And um, that's clearly a uh, part of why we're, we're where we are. Others have said, so I don't know, the struggles are still here. The, the issues, if anything, are more, more, um, more vital than ever. The impact of this, uh, the Tory cuts on COVID and the crisis in capitalism on uh, working class people is, is clear. And so actually putting more of our energies outside, the, the big issue, and I don't have the answers, but, and I don't think we should expect to have all the answers uh, right now, um, we need more time, you know, we don't have much, but we do need time for more meetings like this. We need time for education. We need to share our knowledge, listen to each other. Um, we need to be involved in the things on the ground and help people to join up the dots. People are amazing, you know, welcoming refugees, volunteering in food banks, uh, volunteering in CABs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People are overwhelmingly compassionate when they're actually confronted with the real situation. And then we go into this charity world and somehow or other, we don't necessarily join up the political dots. So people think they're not political or not interested in, polit in politics, but they are. They care about the, the, uh, the difficulties of getting petrol. They really care about the rise in fuel prices. Many, many, many people are affected by, anyway, etc. I don't need to go into great details with this audience. So part of the discussion needs to be how do we join up the dots without hectoring, lecturing, uh, accusing people of being stupid, blah, 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 blah. So some, some th thoughts about that to actually equip a lot of the young people and ourselves, because we've all got to learn, us old people, how to organize, not only in the new political circumstances, but the new, I mean, it's still, some of the social media stuff is very, very new. Some of it's great, you know, we could organize this meeting at a moment's notice, and some of it is really pernicious, uh, nasty stuff going around. And we think we're getting a great hearing and all the algorithms are doing this in our bubbles. Um, so we just reinforce it. So all of those things need to be examined um, and we need to maybe work out a program of how we're gonna to start to do that in our areas and nationally like this. But um, the, the socialists haven't gone away, the causes haven't gone away, the ideas haven't gone away, and our responsibility, and I think this is part of what Ken Loach was saying, we've got to get those people before they do get scattered to the wind, or more worryingly, and the thing that uh, frightens me, is the potential attraction of the um, populist right, and I think that's what Starmer was appealing to, when you look at his appalling, uh, appalling language, um, and that to me is a big worry. And a final word on solidarity, and I have made this point at various speeches around conference and before. Solidarity with people like me who've been kicked out might risk you being suspended or expelled from the Labour Party. Now, I'm not suggesting people do stupid things and get themselves kicked out, but actually get some backbone particularly older people, younger people, I have heard have had terrible problems with their work, particularly if they're accused of anti-Semitism, has actually had big impacts. But you have to really think, what have we got to lose, most of us? Fighters for social justice in other parts of the world are having their heads kicked in, are getting imprisoned and getting tortured. And we might be going that way, probably not the torture, but when we look at what's happening with the protest bill and the fantastic comrades in Manchester marching today, against the, uh, the, the the pernicious bills that are going through those those struggles are really real 
Um, and we can't turn our back on it just because we haven't got a left wing uh, Labour Party. And we are not going to get any fight back on that from a star money party. Anyway, I spoke longer than I meant to. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, uh, Leah. Great to see you. And uh, just to say that I was um, accused of being an anti-Semite by Hirsch in the Hirsch report, commissioned by a Labour mayor of Newham, Roxana Fiaz, because I like to tweet that um, was about Chris Williamson. And I didn't even, it, I didn't even write the tweet myself, I just liked it, that someone else had written. I mean, it's just bonkers. Um, now look, time's getting short. I, d I do really want everybody to have the opportunity to speak. If you've spoken once, you're not gonna be able to get in uh, a second time. I'm sorry, that's very clear. Uh, I'd like to go over time, if that's possible. And I'd like the people who are involved in uh, organising the Zoom to tell me whether that's possible, only by 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask people to be really, really strict about time. So Danny Spate, you're on now. So, OK, thank you, Carol, for letting me in. I'm Danny Spate from Labour International CLP. Um, and, and thank you, Roger, for inviting me. And thank you very much for reading out Ken Loach's letter. I, I only ever met him once back in 1969 when him and Tony Garnett came down to uh, Jerry Healy run Young Socialist Summer Camp and tried to teach us a bunch of working class kids a little bit about drama. I'm afraid not much of it stuck, but I certainly agree that what we've got to be looking at is a, a movement that can unite both those still inside the party and those outside the party and solidarity to those people that have been forced out of the party. Um, it, it's got to be a movement built around unifying demand policies programs, campaigns that we can all join and, and would make it extremely difficult for the right to expel us for being part of it. Um, a new political party would only really work if someone like Corbyn, who could bring in a following, started it. I mean, if, if the right wing are stupid enough not to give him the whip back so he stands as an independent, and, and Corbyn has the courage to actually start a new party, then you could have a new party. But without that, we just go back to the usual group, grouplets. Um, our fight really, when it comes down to it, is with the PLP. Um, as I look at Starmer, I suddenly started to think, you know what this man wants. He wants he's waiting for the, the Tories to stick the knife in the back of Johnson when he's no longer in use. And it is looking like he's, he's quite happy being in a coalition with whatever part of the Conservative Party actually takes over. So what would be the unifier for party in people inside the party to take on what's being given to us at the moment. And, and I, I think as far as the left in Labour International can see, open selection is the answer. It may never win, but we couldn't do anything this year because of the three year rule. But next year, it's a possibility. Now, Labour International Officers are also being hit by auto exclusions. Um, Colin O'Driscoll was expelled, as you probably know. Um, but if, but we've been talking in Labour International, and we've already started to reorganise the open selection campaign, which so nearly won three years ago, two years ago. Um, it, it was let down by. Corbyn and McDonald and McCluskey and Momentum. 
but I think a second shot, whether it can win or not, I've got no ideas because the the makeup of the party is changing by people being forced out or walking away. But it would be a unifying force with inside the party. And I don't think there's anything stronger than that demand as a rule change that could actually bring the left together inside the party. Outside the party, we just need that movement where we can give our solidarity with the people that are outside and the new groups and the, the, the ecological movement and such like. But um, I'm, I'm very much for that idea anyway. Thank you, I didn't need five minutes. Thank you very much, Danny. Good to hear, hear you and good to hear that Labour International represented at this meeting today. That's really brilliant. Well, I know that Esther's name is at the bottom of the list, but Esther, your name was up on my written list earlier and then it fell away. Would you like to come in now? You're muted. Yeah. Hello, comrades. Hello, comrades, speaking from... Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, Esther. So um, there, there, there's obviously been um, a lot of contribution this evening, such as ideas are probably beginning to form uh, among us, but um, I wanted to emphasize the importance of us having agreed principles uh, and a strategy, and um, principles that will include, of course, democratic socialism, um, class, sol class solidarity, no witch hunting, absolutely no which hunting, um, um, an analysis obviously based on class analysis. And we need to fix those principles and build a strategy from that. And I'd like to ask a question as to how we think we will go about that, because just talking about things um, won't make things happen unless we do something. Um, I think working, working locally um, to build class consciousness is a really, really important thing. And in reflecting on that and, and reflecting what people have said about leadership and possibly looking for a leader, I'd like to suggest that the old models of leadership are perhaps outdated. And if we're seriously thinking about ourselves as a grassroots democratic movement, then we do need to think about different models of leadership that are not top down but a bottom up and as part of our strategy, I think we need to think how we are going to do that so that we engage in action locally rather than um, talking nationally. In the same way that we used to talk about nationalization and now we're talking about municipal socialism. And in reaching out to people, again, we don't want to be writing in the sun we want to be building education programs, um, engagement and activity locally that's not based on charity, but in, that's based on doing solid work in the community. And Carol and, and Roger, I heard what you said about the newer model. And I think there's a lot um, that, that, that we need to learn from that. So in, in summarizing, yes, we need principles, we need a strategy, we need to agree how we are going to go about that, and we need to look at new models of leadership. Thank you, comrades. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, so I'm going to move now to Jackie, Jackie Hyatt. Yeah, thanks very much. It was using Jackie's name, it's uh, Larry Hyatt. Um, the issue as far as i can see is is that um within the labor party and following the conference that uh, open selection and democracy within the labor party is dead and there's no retrieving it as far as i can see at this present moment the um the, the issue as far as i was concerned is that the um the corbyn leadership failed to galvanize members to a movement of class struggle and the um the organisation that some people have spoken about is, is, is not there. What we need to be concentrating on is a movement of uh, political ideas 
based around um, democracy, solidarity, and republicanism to bring about a socialist society. If we don't have th that ingredient, then we, we're failing in our analysis. And the um, the party is on a pivotal in a pivotal situation, um, and it's not about being in or out of the Labour Party. The left are fixated on this idea, and it's about building a movement. A movement has to become has to come through networking. And the organisation today is is a prime example. If we've had over a hundred people attending with others in the waiting room then that's the type of thing that we need to be building upon. Um, the network of socialists throughout the country. Um, the Blair years did away with some of that strategy with the cooperation of the DUC, in as much as in most boroughs, we had things called uh, trade union support units, yeah. which I've been campaigning for ever since. Uh, we lost our one in Southwark. Uh, which did marvellous work with um, building links between trade unions, different sectors that didn't know each other, but they had a common strategy of defending their terms and conditions through a class struggle. And these are the things that the TUC and the Labour Party destroyed. We need to rebuild that. If we're going to have a, a serious discussion and way forward about building a movement, we need to build it on the ground. It's, it's no use um, having conference after conference of the left. We need to be talking to the working class, um, not analysing the working class. And to, I can't remember ever having a conversation since Corbyn came in and with people, you know, I, I use example, I, I thought I've talked to workers in Tesco's about joining a trade union and things like that. They've never, ever said to me, isn't it a shame that the Labour Party is expelling all these members? They've never said to me, I didn't know that the, work, the working class people in Labour were anti-Semitic. They've never raised it. It's a fixation of the left within the Labour movement that keeps raising these issues. We have to be fighting the leadership of the Labour Party. When we had people suspended from these positions, what we did, we relied upon publicity to put our case. We never took direct action against the regional officers. Uh, Newham, Newham is, is doing that very thing, but we never campaigned on an open basis to confront the regional officers and and. Uh, challenge their authority over the CLPs. That was that has never been the case. We, it's obviously, I, in my opinion, we missed the boat now. Uh, but that is how we should have done it. Instead of um, campaigning on a publicity, you know, having a whip round to take a case to court, all those things are superfluous to the class struggle. The class struggle has to be done at a rank and file level within the, the within the trades councils, within trade union branches, and that those people are committed to a socialist movement uh, representing them. Thank you very much. Oh, no, so, yeah, I've finished now. Uh, unless, of course, you want to give me another 10 minutes, Mark. We Thank you very much. We can build it on I think a I've frozen. Hello. No, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, yes, we can. I think Carol's. Carol, okay, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. If Carell is not with us, I think the next is uh, Dominic. Yeah, I, I just want to make a, a few points. I don't know how long I'm going to, it's obviously not going to be more than five minutes. I've been in the Labour Party now over 50 years, and I joined the Labour Party uh, because a union I was in was campaigning against Daryl Wilson's in place of strife, and we, we had a campaign for members to join. Party and fight against that. 
I think the one thing that came up to me in some of the contributions was this personalization of Starmer. Starmer is not the key, to, as far as I'm concerned, the key, uh, years was that basically he didn't tackle the parliamentary Labour Party and tackle the apparatus because Starmer is a creature of the parliamentary Labour Party and the apparatus or the majority of the Le parliamentary Labour Party, which is anti-socialist. And it appears that the whole of the apparatus is uh, anti-socialist. They basically got the idea of divine right of, of uh, Labour MPs to stay in power until they die. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to touch on was this question of leaving the Labour Party. As far as I go, I've no intention to leave the Labour Party. It uh, doesn't mean to say I might, when we start getting active again, because we haven't in Manchester yet, at least this part of Manchester, uh, might get kicked out. That's another matter. But I think this question of organising, to my mind, what we should be looking at is a basic starting point. And I think the basic starting point I'd be looking at would be a campaign based around defending and advancing the interests of the working class. And I think that encompasses everything from inflation to climate change. I'm not just talking about sort of pay and all that sort of stuff. It encompasses all the near working class. And we take ambitions and make demands. And the demands should be placed on the leadership of the Labour Party and the leadership of the trade unions. Because without raising the question of what are these people there for, I don't think we'll ever make any serious steps forward. So I think that is a major thing as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I think somebody touched on the question of the 2017 election. I think we've got to face facts that if we had got a Corbyn government, the right wing of the Parliamentary Labour Party would have sabotaged the programme, maybe even caused a split at that stage. So I, I think that it's not a question of uh, organising a leader. It's a question at this stage of raising the political issues and having a campaign. And we need some sort of organisation. Working people have got to have somewhere to go to actually get organised and do things. It's not a question of individual actions. So I think... Uh, I think I'll leave it at that to be brief so other people can get in. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dominic. Uh, next is John Dunn. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I'll try and be brief because uh, I'm getting messages that my bandwidth's a bit low. I think he's caught it uh, from me. I've got a bit frustrated with this discussion and this fixation with building a party. You know, we don't need another party. What do you do? You build a party and the first thing you discuss is which section of which fourth international of the eyes varieties that you affiliate to, etc., etc. The movement has never, ever, in the last 20, 30 years, been stronger. We don't need to build anything it's already there. And while I've been listening, I've been just writing down victories that we've achieved recently. Now, I know that COVID has cut across a lot of what we do and people, are, you know, you do things via Zoom and it creates its own little bubbles and that. But let's just look what we have achieved in the last year or so. The Shrewsbury Pickets won a tremendous victory after 47 years and cleared themselves. The Spy Cops campaigners have just won a, man, a fantastic victory in a tribunal against police rape and against the whole weight of the establishment. The Blacklist campaign are bringing a tiny handful of activists are bringing national, uh, uh, multinational companies and the big building empires to their knees and they've won millions and millions of pounds in compensation. Now, did, did they sit back? Did any of the people involved in them groups and said, we'd better wait for a new mass party of Labour to emerge before we act? No, they went and did it 
The Labour movement is waking up. The left have just taken control of Unison. Unison uh, delegation to Labour Party conference were appointed before the left took control. Unison itself, the establishment within, have set up a task force to dismantle the left. They've started on Paul Holmes. And if anybody's around on Friday, uh, where Paul's being victimised by the, a new, a new Labour council, get along to Ainley Top to the Cedar Hotel at nine o'clock on Friday and show your support. But they're making great strides inside that union. The election of Sharon Graham in Unite is the new beginning. And she beat the entire left establishment, you know, the fraudsters, the Shiraz, look at me how left I am when I've never done anything, establishment candidates. And rather than attend Labour Party conference and move a resolution to be ignored, she was out on the picket lines and unite themselves have won tremendous victories recently. Rolls Royce, uh, British Airways stopping higher and higher. So get involved in this. Trace councils are being reinvigorated. And I find myself, I've been suspended now for the second time from Labour. They've done me a bleeding great favour. I don't have to sit boring my ass off in meetings listening to absolute idiots talk about nonsense and deliver leaflets for even bigger idiots. So they've done me the, the movement. What I'm saying is it's alive and well. And if you're thinking of staying and fighting in, in Labour, I've got some news for you. In the areas that I come from, many of the coalfield areas, many of the abandoned industrial areas, Labour is a toxic brand. They didn't lose the last general election because of this myth put about by the snowflake left that all workers voted Tory. No, workers didn't bother to vote because they fed up of Labour selling them out. And, and on, on councils in these areas, good community activists are taking the places of sterile, boring, dead in from the neck up Labour councillors who've never done anything. So as Leah said, we have to join these dots up. You know, I'm optimistic. We, we stand now on the new beginning. And I think, you know, if anybody's despondent and, you know, people will be saying, don't use cowards, words like cowards, don't use this. Well, I don't know what you call people who are more concerned with being able to sit in a Labour Party meeting and move a token resolution than stand in solidarity uh, with, with, with uh, expelled comrades, etc., etc. For goodness sake, nobody's putting us up against walls and shooting us yet, debarring us from going to boring meetings. And I'll finish on this. If you really want to see the Labour movement at its finest and at its strongest, the Durham Gala, the second Saturday next July, will be the biggest, the strongest ever. 37 years ago, Margaret Thatcher said she destroyed the enemy within. If Margaret Thatcher couldn't destroy us, then the Starmeroids, the establishment we've got now, can't do it. We're alive and well, comrades. Get active. Understood that Carell is back with us now. But if not, Ed is the next speaker anyway. Ed Boba. Um, thanks, Roger or Carell. Um, uh, thanks very much, John, for a very um, inspiring contribution. Um, uh, I, the Corbyn movement was a quarter of a revolution. It wasn't, it wasn't anything like a, a fundamental change of society. And many people read more into its potential than, than was there. I remember being um, on, on doorsteps talking to people 
who had never thought about politics before, but because there were things in what Corbyn was saying about raising living standards and um, changing the relationship between um, uh, big companies and uh, impoverished families and so on, that, so that, so that uh, people, so that the poorest in society were given greater priority. I remember people awakening for the first time to the idea that politics might be relevant to them, that it might be worth getting involved, that it might be worth voting. And um, that, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about what we're trying to build now. John, John's referred to a lot of important changes that are taking place in society. And they're, uh, in a way, they're underneath the surface because they're not highlighted by the mainstream media. Um, but, uh, you know, during the Corbyn period, there were, the, the policy making that was going on by ordinary members of the Labour Party was an indication of the kind of way, new ways that society can be organised in a, in, a, in a genuinely socialist environment. Um, there's, I, I think many comrades in the Labour Party were... Um, under the illusion that all you needed to do was get Corbyn into government and then, hey, presto, we would have a socialist society. That would only be the beginning, the, the very first beginning. And I, I therefore very much agree with the, the, the point that was put from Ken Loach's uh, message at the beginning of this meeting, that we need to bring all those who are outside the Labour Party and all those socialists who are inside the Labour Party, we need to have some form of organisation that brings us together because that is undoubtedly the beginning of what will move onwards to take what started under Jeremy Corbyn to take its, its next step forward. I, I mean, I, it's very significant, even though it's a small union, that the Bakers Union has disaffiliated from, from the Labour Party. It can be a sign of things to come. We will get the impetus to build something new. Um, and um, I, I think um, the comrade who spoke, I think it's Steve Freeman, his name was, about we need a new means of regenerating democracy. I think he, he's absolutely right. We, I, if I remember, Steve was saying, you know, we need to be able to rally all kinds of people. Part of this new movement may well get a, 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 an impetus from a new movement on the streets. I mean, there, there's, there's terrible poverty. There's nurses going to food banks because they can't feed their kids. There's huge frustration, you know, uh, uh, furloughs ending, um, people don't know how to make ends meet, people, people are desperate for houses, desperate to get food in the bellies of their children and so on, that, that a, a movement on the streets could be a catalyst for something big, could be, it could be any time, it might be delayed, it could be within the next few months or weeks. So we're, we're in a situation where revolution is just below the surface of society. And when we do get a new movement, it's got to be a movement that's got more to its programme than all we want to do is get a Labour leader elected into Parliament. It's going to, it's going to be far more like um, Chile in the early 1970s if we get a Labour government elected than, um, than anything like a Harold Wilson government. It's gonna be from the very beginning, there's gonna be mass resistance from the ruling class. All kind of, if, we think, if we think Corbyn's movement was sabotaged, the sabotage that would be perpetrated against a, a, a new socialist government coming to power through parliament would immediately show, Cor Corbyn began to show this, his movement began to show the limitations of parliamentary democracy. So I agree with the comrade Steve, who said we need, we need to find new ways of rallying people in towns and cities. And we need to be talking, this, is, this links with the points John was making about the trade unions. We need to be thinking about how workplace democracy begins to fit in with policy making at a national level. This was, after all, the way that the Russian workers 
uh, brought about the overthrow of capitalism in 1917 by not, not through the, the means of a bourgeois parliament, but through the means of workers' organizations taking the power in their own hands. And we have to be working towards that in the new organization that we are capable of building from the, the, the class consciousness that is already uh, beginning to develop in British society at the moment. Thank you. I think Corel is back with us now. So I won't use her position. I am back now. Thank you, Roger. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry about that, comrades. Um, thank you, Ed. And can I ask Jabu, who um, is here today? Can you come in, Jabu? Good to see you. You're muted, Jabu. Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, Jabu. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, comrades, for such an inspiring uh, talk today. I'm sitting here, uh, I've been taking my hand off and putting it back because I've been thinking, oh, they've said all what I wanted to say. But uh, I, one of the things that I keep thinking to myself is that there's nothing frightening to the Labour Party than awakening the beast in the street. The idea that we could mobilize the real working class. I am part of that working class. Uh, I've, ca I've come to, I've, I've, I've ended up in the city council in Oxford because some comrades, some privileged white men have decided that we will help the working class. We need a strategy that brings more people from the grassroots to get into these positions. We're not leaving the Labour Party. The Labour Party is our movement. It is a working class movement. So for me, there is no alternative but to, to, to fight in the Labour Party. I, 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 I have fought in Oxford to the point that I'm now a chair of the Oxford District Labour Party. This is a district Labour Party that has the likes of Luke Akerst, who are affiliates with uh, 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 Israel. A couple of months ago, part of me and a few councillors that were, were new councillors that were coming in, we wrote a statement uh, basically in solidarity with Palestine. We all signed the statement. We knew we could be expelled, but we said to hell with it. We had to stand up. We called it what it is. We said, this is an apartheid state. At that time, we're told that anybody that refers to Israel as an apartheid state is in for a guillotine. So I said, I grew up in an apartheid state and I know what apartheid looks like. And you're not gonna tell me what I should be saying about apartheid. So my point is, I've had all the comrades. Uh, thank you, John, for your inspiring uh, uh, messages on the victories. Even tomorrow, I met the Reading uh, Baksha Hospital. The strikers have been there for almost a year. Sharon Graham is coming to speak at that rally. There are so many uh, victories that we have to look, 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 look to as an inspiration to keep on fighting in the Labour Party. But more than anything, we have to look at people like me and see that things are possible. I came into an area which is known for its despondency, but I took the majority and, and, and actually got rid of a right-wing labor a, a, a councillor who's been here for a very long time. He came second to me. They were all shocked. I mean, they, I remember a couple of years ago when I was ward organizer of this area, when uh, I first uh, sort of joined, like came, came into the Labour Party around 20, 2015 because of Corbyn. And uh, when, I, when, when, when they asked why I had, uh, wh how I had mobilized this area so that Labour increased its majority, they chuckled and they said she must have threatened them with a machete. I have been subjected to so much racism, but I said to them that year that uh, even, even if you can say that all those things, I am staying in the Labour Party and today I am their chair. So what we need in this whole of the, the UK, we need people like me, we need people that can step aside and mobilize more grassroots activists to take on positions in the Labour Party. This is our movement. Thank you.
Corel, you're muted. Thank you, Jabu. Um, there are four hands up still, and I'm not taking any more now, so no more hands, please. Um, the, uh, the speakers are Harry, Becky, Christine and Norman. I don't know which one of you want to speak. And then John Ryman. I'm going to ask you because of time to keep it very brief and to make your point succinctly. Right, over to Harry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Harry. The, the Liberal Party in Northern Ireland here. I think the, the, the key question we've got to ask, you know, in this question, what do we stay or do we leave? The question you've got to ask is where will the working class people oriented towards in a period of crisis or opportunity? Now, we, we saw when the Cohen Corbyn became leader, leader that that was a period indeed of opportunity. OK, there was crisis in society and we saw what happened. It swelled the ranks of the Labour Party, transformed it. And this is the key question. Now, that is a political and an objective situation. It's almost a scientific one, that the working class people will remain and continue to orientate towards the mass, the mass party, which is the Labour Party and the trade union movement. I'm a former member of the militant. And uh, if you recall, in the 90s, the militant was very, very powerful inside the Labour Party. The reason why is that they were organised at the grassroots, built from the bottom up and built within the constituencies. It was not the purge that ended the militant. The militant made a crucial and fatal mistake, is that they decided to move outside the mass working class parties not only in Britain, but right across the world. It finished the militant and it finished the international because of that crucial mistake that they made. We need to be absolutely clear that the Labour Party remains the mass working class party and the one that people were ori oriented towards. And not only that, it's our connection, not only to the to 400,000 members, the trade union movement, but it's also the connection to working class people in general. You take, you take, for example, the poll tax movement. It was created by the militant at that time, reached out into labor and trade union members, but also to people in general. That was their connection. It was done by effectively not a very huge party, but because it had a program that was going to take on that issue. <clears throat> I think we're a little over fixated in simply getting a new leader, a left leader, with where the real concentration is building the movement from below. And if you look at the Corbyn initiative, he was not under any sustained pressure really from below. It was left to momentum under Landsman. And we followed Landsman for a great period inside the party until effectively he betrayed us. And the pressure on the Corbyn and the McDonald, I mean, I am actually very surprised that they remain quite popular on the left because when you look at the legacy what they've done i mean even from the outset the purge began immediately corburn became leader and he did not stand up against it he wasn't under any sustained pressure from the left to stand up against the purges he turned a blind eye to a great deal of it they sold out on the nuclear question that was one of the first thing they did brexit um, the election of MPs, again, because the movement, a genuine left movement, was not built up inside the Labour Party. Where do we go from here? Um, I think it's already um, um, the, uh, mentioned by some of you, and I, I think Ed's point is very, very important that he makes. It's not just building an, inside the party and the ones that have been expelled to bring them inside a left movement. But we need a radical program because I agree with Ed. There's, you get a feeling that things are changing on the streets. These are crises on the Brexit, on food shortages and fuel shortages and the nuclear question. These are crises that are now upon us. And we need a radical program to transform society, not just reformism, but we need a revolutionary program inside the left parties. We need a clear socialist 
program on the left, and we need to set that out and, and bring the coordinate the left groups as much as possible uh, um, to build and organize from the bottom up. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. So I'm going to move swiftly on now to Becky. You're still muted, Becky. Maybe. Yeah, okay. we can hear you. I'm muted now? Yeah. Okay. It's been a very, very interesting discussion. Um, I'm a little bit anxious that our energies don't get dissipated by endless conversations about the Labour Party. I think that's a distraction. And I agree with what Harry just said, and I think Esther said it earlier, about we, we have to establish a programme that the left, whether inside or out the Labour Party, will push for. And we'll push for in our communities, um, in the constituencies and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I don't have the luxury of any choice because I, I'm expelled from the, the Labour Party. Um, one of the things that I would like to see in a programme, and I do think is a priority for us all, is um, the ability to speak. Um, and that has systematically been taken away from us. I know as somebody who lives in Brighton, we have had venues shut down to the left, um, pressure's been put on them. We've just seen David Miller sacked for his research into propaganda and um, global um, corruption. Um, I think we are living in a very, very dangerous t time in terms of our ability to speak about a programme. We need a programme, then we need to be able to speak about it. And we really do have to um, get wise, you know, because we know it's happened to us within the Labour Party. The current Labour Party, I believe, would be more repressive on freedom of speech than the Tories ever would be. Um, and, and this has got to be a major part of our programme. We are free to speak. We are free to assemble. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Becky. That was great. Um, could I now ask, I don't know whether it's Christine or Norman, but one of you, please. Where's Christine or Norman? Yeah, you're muted, Norman. I can't hear you. Asset? Yeah, is that all right? Yes, it's yeah, Norman. Can, you can you hear me now? Yeah. So it, it's, it's Norman because Christine is in agony on her back at the moment with a, a back problem. Um, but I'm going to say something that I'm sure she will uh, agree with. Um, I think, yes, we need a programme, and I think we can work out a programme across the left, across all the left groups. Um, and I think we need, yes, we need the freedom to speak about it, and we need the freedom to assemble. But what we need is a plan of action. And to do that, we need to actually put pressure on whatever politicians are in our way, Labour, Tories, whoever they are, to put our ideas into action. And the way we need to do that is we need to take some lessons from Extinction Rebellion, but we need to be better than Extinction Rebellion. And we need, we, there are many, many more of us than Extinction Rebellion. They've got small numbers of people, but have been extremely affected in what they've done. So we need to act, but we need to plan and we need to work out what we're doing and we need to put those plans into action across the country so that the politicians will face such an overwhelming uh, uh, pressure, they will give in, they will make concessions. I would, but we need to prioritize, pick our targets. And I would suggest that the NHS would be one of the first targets, in fact, the first target, because if we came out and fought the NHS in the way that they can't because they are doctors and nurses, but we can because not all of us are doctors and nurses, we can come out with them, for them, and in solidarity with them, and we can have day after 
day after day of campaigning for them and the public will be behind us to a personal because no, nothing is valued more in the country than the NHS, especially since COVID. So let's do that, let's, but let's get together, let's work out the programme and let's work out how we're going to do it because it's action we need. Not lots more words, not lots more thinking about how we fight inside the Labour Party to do this, that, and the other. Whether you're in the Labour Party or whether you're outside the Labour Party, you get together and you fight for a good social programme and put the NHS, I would suggest, at the top of the list. Thanks. Thank you, Norman. And um, our last speaker from the floor. I will give um, Roger a, la a last couple of minutes, but is John Ryman. Please be brief, John. So I think that we have to start with a, an assessment of the actual state of affairs, both between the classes and within the working class itself, not as we wish it were, but as, we, as it actually is. And I don't agree with the uh, implication of some of the speakers that as I understood it, that the movement is everything and the organization of the working class is nothing or relatively minor question. Now, maybe it's entirely different in Britain, although I would be surprised it is. Here in the United States, the situation within the unions, which are the only mass working class organizations that we have ever re really had, the situation is nearly disaster. You have a union leadership that is absolutely uh, right across the board. Uh, the entire union leadership is absolutely committed to this idea that they have to help their employers increase their profit in order to, quote, compete with, the, with, the, uh, with others. Uh, I think we've lost John. Sorry, John. I think we've lost you. Can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, please be very brief though, because we're right at the end. So uh, I was just saying that the situation in the unions here is, in, is a real disaster. And because of the role of the leadership in the main, you have actually the majority of white blue collar workers who vo voted for Trump and that, uh, includes, you know, complete with all the fantasies that uh, Trumpism entails, and actually large, and, and including the anti-science views, which uh, run right through the working class or large sectors of it, including amongst black workers. Um, and you also have, for instance, just yesterday, we had these big mass marches throughout the United States on, uh, in favor of abortion rights. I went to one that was uh, thousands and thousands of people in San Francisco. I did not see not one union banner, not one union uh, uh, sign, not one union t-shirt even. That really shows how completely missing in action the unions are in, in, the, in the movement. The same has been true for Black Lives Matter and so on. So, just the last point I want to make, I believe that the most important struggle here in the United States in uh, recent months has been the struggle of carpenters up in Western Washington against their own union leadership. And it has been in many ways uh, really inspirational. I'm not sure if they're going to succeed or not, but there will be no real revival of the working class movement here in the United States without us that open, overt, uh, conflict between the rank and file and the union leadership. And I suspect that um, things are not entirely different there in, in Britain. Anybody that wants to know more about the struggle in Western Washington, I've had a whole series of articles and videos. I was up there on my blog site, Oakland Socialist. Thank you. Thank you. Put something in the chat now because of the time. Um, I just... One of the disadvantages of being the chair is you don't get to, to say what you want to say. I just want to say something very quickly uh, before I uh, ask Roger just to have a couple of minutes to talk about next steps, etc. In Newham, the poorest, one of the poorest boroughs in the country, we are in a desperate situation. 
We have 10,000 people here with no recourse to public funds. We have the highest housing waiting list in the country, 28,000 plus individuals. We have luxury flats going up where the lights are turned on and off at the concierge system because they're being used as investment. And so we know about the class war here um, and we understand solidarity. So that's why when we were suspended, we had to set up something that keeps people who are in the Labour Party with us and people who felt they couldn't stay or had been expelled, etc., that we would all stand together. And it is about joining up the dots. As Roger said, the Labour Party completely dominates in this area. And we're building our movement from below. And if I say to you, just as John Dunn said, the Labour Party is despised here. It's absolutely despised. And, you know, even, even the few middle class people that, that live in, in the north part of the borough are seeing developers coming in and taking um, into private hands public spaces. People talk, a lot of talk about leadership. I'm not looking for a leader because the leadership lies with all of us. The leadership lies with the ordinary working class people. And because the situation is so desperate, it does mean that there will be a huge movement from below as the, the cut in universal credit is felt, um, the, the rises in uh, fuel, et cetera, are felt if you can get any. So it's our responsibility to make sure that there is an, a group of people, an organization, call it what you like, who are there, who are fighting. We've got, a, we've got a program around housing. We've got a program around health and education. We've already, we've already had a lot of those conversations and written them. We're active in our trade unions. We're very active in the Trades Council. And we are part of lots of grassroots fight backs. Now's the time for us to come together in a united front in our borough. And we had our founding, founding meeting yesterday. And we expect that hundreds of people will be joining um, uh, us in our fight to make sure there's democracy, decent housing, decent schools, no academization, no privatization in our borough. So the answer doesn't lie being with Starmer. The answer lies with you and with our people, our class. So on that note, Roger, I'm going to hand over for a very brief final word to you. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, comrades. I'm not going to say, uh, obviously, there are many things I like to say, but, what, but I think the most important thing I want to say is what a fantastically good discussion this was. And I, I know it's normal at the end of a meeting to say it's been a very good discussion, but I think we all know we mean something something different happened today. And you know why? Because this was the first meeting I can remember coming to uh, in the whole recent wave of meetings about the Labour Party, where there was a real opportunity for everybody to speak and to put their point of view, and they had the time uh, and the opportunity to do it. We didn't have a big um, platform of speakers uh, I remember one meeting I went to organised by the Socialist Campaign Group of MPs, which was two or three hours, and it was every single, well, probably every single member of the Socialist Campaign Group spoke for five minutes. There was no, uh, no discussion, there was no, um, not even any questions allowed for on the chat line or anything. It was simply one after the other, MPs telling us to stay and fight. Uh, rather, they didn't even say that, they said, don't leave. Um, uh, stay and fight well. I mean, they seem to be, as I say, better at doing the first half of that than, than the uh, second. The fight is coming from the rank of file here. Now, we've shown there's enormous talent and experience and a wealth of ideas within our movement. And uh, that's what we base ourselves on. Now, the, the seem to be really a consensus developing. Obviously, there are many things, many things that comrades uh, differed on. But generally speaking, there's a consensus coming that we need to develop inside and outside the Labour Party. 
that we need to, the comrades who still have that chance to fight in the Labour Party, they should do it. But they must use that opportunity to fight. There should be no, absolutely um, no thought given to the idea that we have to stay in and we have to compromise our ideas and we have to uh, modify the way we speak and so on in order to uh, maintain that place in the Labour Party. We go in and we put our point of view and we um, we fight for our ideas. And if we're if we're kicked out, well, so what? So what? I've just been kicked out too. So what? Um, you know, uh, so was Nye Bevan. So was George Lansbury. So was Michael Foote. So were the Liverpool councillors. I mean, that's that's um, that means nothing. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm proud to be uh, standing um, in their in their ranks. But the uh, question of the question is why do we let Obviously, we we'll we'll, we want a movement where we're both in, where we have comrades, whether or not they're members of the Labour Party or being expelled or dropped out or are fed up with the Labour Party or what. Why should we let Keir Starmer decide who should be members of our political circle? That's just not on. We have to say we're together anyway, and where we work is uh, is a matter of local circumstances, personal preferences and all kinds of things. I mean, the, the, the point is that we must stay together and there seems to be a consensus developing. I was very pleased to hear that um, uh, Ken Loach said, what we want is uh, a movement. I saw, I heard that Chris Williamson, I think, has said something very similar, that what we need is a movement. A movement is, is a kind of um, stepping stone towards a party. A movement means that we have a, um, an area where we are discussing, where we're campaigning, where we're fighting together, where we're, where we're promoting ideas and so on. In my opinion, a new party is coming. A new party is developing. I, I, why do I say not the Labour Party? I don't discount the Labour Party, but the Labour Party is two parties. The Labour Party has always been, well, certainly since 1994, the Labour Party has been two parties. And it's not, I don't say that. Tony Blair said that. Tony Blair said, I'm not Labour, I'm new Labour. I'm different. And he was right, it was different. Because the first thing that Tony Blair did when he became leader was to call a special conference where, with the sole objective of scrapping Clause 4, the socialist clause in the Labour Party constitution. And he did that because that was a uh, guarantee to the ruling class to say, don't worry, we're with you, you can trust us. We don't even pretend anymore to be moving towards uh, some kind of new society or um, socialist uh, socialist society. So the Labour Party is two parties, and in Newham it has already taken organisational form. In Newham we do have um, two parties, as Carell has explained. All the, um, the all the everything that was healthy and positive and militant in the Newham uh, Labour parties is uh, acting now under the banner of Newham Socialist Labour. We haven't, we haven't left the Labour Party, but if they decide that they, uh, they don't want us, we're not going to go home, we're not going to just keep quiet, we're going to go on campaigning for, for what we believe in and what is needed by the working class of Newham and by the working class of the country. So therefore, I think that um, Newham Socialist Labour is a prototype. That's my idea. We don't all agree. But the question is, if we are going to uh, to move forward, it must be on the basis that most of the comrades here have agreed and uh, the, the way that Ken Roach put it, as a movement, and a movement which will probably end up as something a bit more than a movement and something a bit more, um, more, more tangible, uh, uh, in other words, a, a party. But that will take its time, that will develop as the process of the struggle continues. So the very last point I want to make is whether we think that... Um, uh, that there's a new movement started now. I think it has. I think John is right. John Don is right in saying that. But um, but in any case, the um, the uh, there is a struggle coming. There are storms ahead. And when I say ahead, we can't wait five years or ten years or twenty years for a new Jeremy Corbyn to emerge or whatever it might be. There is a struggle, a really life and death struggle. Struggles that even in my lifetime, and I'm. Uh, you know, that's quite a long time, I'm afraid. But even in my lifetime, we've never seen struggles that, we, that, we're, uh, that we're going to see ahead. We've got now, we've got a, um, we've got, we've got, I think we're going to see riots developing. It could be tomorrow, it could be next week, it could be a year or two. 
but the youth have got no future. The youth that Keir Starmer is so concerned about their mental health. Well, we've got the only solution for their mental mental health problems, which is to fight for a new society because they've got no, no jobs, no housing, no education to speak of, no uh, and probably no environment which can uh, allow for them to develop a healthy life. And therefore, we have to say we have to fight now. We have no option. We, have no, we haven't got the luxury of waiting. So we build a movement. Now, practically, what's a step? Well, I think we, this is not the end of the, uh, the discussion. This is the beginning. We should, move, we should meet again. We should meet again soon and take it further. Hope, to, hope that we can involve uh, Ken Loach, Chris Williamson, uh, comrades who are still in the, in the uh, Labour Party. Of course, if, at all, if we can possibly persuade them, then comrades uh, from the Socialist Campaign group of MPs too. We want a broad movement. We want to, uh, we, we, we want to develop a dialogue and develop a plan of action because we need a new socialist leadership. And that is coming because it's needed in the objective situation we have. So thank you. And the last thing I'd say, anybody who wants to sign up, the Workers International Network has meetings every week, international meetings. We have comrades from a dozen countries, from all the continents. We hear reports of struggles from all around the world. Next week, we're having a meeting uh, where we hear the truth about the Syrian civil war from a Syrian Marxist. Um, if anybody is not on our mailing list and wants to be on it, uh, please, however you heard about this, please um, make sure you get onto our, our mailing list. Thank you very much, comrades. It's been an absolutely brilliant meeting. Thank you all for your contributions. Thank you, comrades. I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Oh, I'd say...